And welcome back into another edition of the Extra Point here on WEGL 91.1 FM or online at WEGLFM.com. I'm your host, Jared Dude, alongside me is the one. It's the only Brooks. Brooks Childress. Brooks. Hola. How are you doing today on this cold Thursday morning here on the plains? I stepped out of my apartment this morning, and you know the movie, I think it's The Day After Tomorrow, where everything never like freezes. Seen You've never seen The Day After Tomorrow? Nope. I've never oh seen Star gosh. Wars either. Oh, oh my nope. gosh. Uh. Anyway. Anyway, in, there's a scene in The Day After Tomorrow where everything like freezes really quickly. That's what I felt like was happening. It was so cold. Apparently... And do not, uh, you know, quote me on this. There's apparently snow flurries going on in Montgomery currently. That it is possible to see snow flurries today if you're heading down to Montgomery. Well, since it's 37 outside, I wouldn't put it past it. So, winter, my fellow comrades, is here. Came early. It did. Bro. Although, I'm going to say this right now. We live in Alabama, so this is our, like, two weeks of winter. And then it's going to be 70s for the rest of the, for until March. That's a cute thing. But, Brooks, here's the thing. There's a lot to talk about in college football. There's a lot to talk about in the NFL. There's NBA talk. There's, I mean, if you want to go into NHL, there's NHL. There's a lot of things, I mean, there's got, a, there's got, a lot of things going on. We've got the weather for it. We do. So, the big thing is, Brooks, where do we start first? Do we start with college football? Do we start with the NFL? Do we start with MLB? Do we start with NBA? They announced some awards last night. Yeah. So, I where... We, we could really go anywhere. Let's take a magical trip around the world. Let's take a magical trip around the world in sports. Let's start with baseball first for the sole fact that... Um, they did just announce awards last year. They announced the Cy Youngs. So let's do that right quick, okay? So right. Rays pitcher Blake Snell went the 2018 AL Cy Young Award. And in a race that was already decided about three months ago, Jacob DeGrom went to 2018 NL Cy Young Award. So DeGrom got 28 first place votes. Max Scherzer got one. I mean, you wanna you wanna know a fun fact? What is that? Jacob Degrom, a 2.71 ERA in his nine losses, a 1.62 ERA in his 13 no decisions, and a 0.89 ERA in his 10 wins. If you look at it, if you look at it, Degrom obviously. I did not get 30 first place votes. <laughs> Degrom obviously deserved it. He pitched a stellar year. The only thing that. You know, you look at his record, and you're like, that's not really the best of records. But he played on the Mets. The Mets really didn't give him backup runs. So he was able to guide his way to a very successful year. He would have had, he would have been one of the, you know, he is one of the best pitchers. But he would have been one of the most dominant pitchers in the postseason had he been on, you know, any other team that wasn't the Mets. He could have guided that team to a possible postseason berth but it wasn't the Mets. On the other side, the AL, Blake Snell, I guess more people liked him than Justin Verlander. I would have gone with Justin Verlander. Verlander had a amazing year. This is Justin Verlander's third time being a runner-up. Justin Verlander had an amazing year this year and just fell a little bit short, but congratulations, Blake Snell. He pitched very well this year. And it's interesting to see that both Cy Young winners came from teams that did not make the playoffs. And, and I mean, usually when it comes to the Cy Young Award, they don't really look at postseason a lot. I mean, they do, but it's like once, you, once the regular season ends, you gotta have if you're not first in the Cy Young like kind of watch list, you gotta have a really a really good postseason. Yeah, and postseason can hurt you. If you don't do well in postseason, and you're playing better opponents, yeah, so you can make that argument. But usually, with these awards, it comes from a team that does make the postseason because that player usually helps guide that team to the postseason. Like MVP, usually on the usually a postseason team. 
most improved player, usually a postseason team. But it's interesting that both players this year that won the Cy Young came from teams that didn't make the postseason. One of them didn't even sniff the postseason. Now, it just goes to show you how great of a year they had that they were able to do this all on a subpar team, and they were able to win these awards on these subpar teams. But still, it it's pretty unique that both players, neither player made the postseason. Brooks, let's switch gears to the NFL, all right? So Le'Veon Bell did not rejoin the Steelers. He gone. It's over. He will not return to Steelers this year. And I'm going to go on a little bit of a limb, but I don't think he's coming back to the Steelers. I don't think so either. So the Le'Veon Bell sweepstakes, I mean, in a sense, already began. But it's now gone into full swing that he's not coming back to the Steelers. I believe he's a free agent after this year because of the franchise tag. Now, can the Steelers tag him again? They could. But I don't know why you would use your franchise tag on him. Especially since you tried to do that this year. And it didn't work out. And it didn't work out in the slightest. So he's gone. And the reports yesterday were, there was a tweet that went out yesterday that the players were raiding his locker and dividing his stuff amongst them. So that that in itself was just a... Ben Roethlisberger commented they're not talking about it because he's not there. They're not going to talk about someone that's not there. Does this hurt Le'Veon Bell with other teams? I think it helps. There's two factors here, and I've said this before. It helps and it hurts him. It helps him that he's not playing this year. If he keeps himself in shape, he's not, you know, out there exerting himself. He's not getting hurt this year. He's not getting in more trouble with the NFL this year. So that helps him there. It's helping himself that he's not willing to settle for this franchise tag that he wants to be paid, and he's one of the best running backs in the NFL right now, so he should be paid. It hurts him, even though, you know, you look at him, and when he has played, he's put up historic numbers. But you look at what James Conner is doing right now in that same Pittsburgh offense— and it kind it, – I'm not saying it, all teams are looking at it this way, but it kind of looks like, well, if James Conner can do this, Le'Veon Bell did this in this offense as well. So is he really that good? And, he, yes, he is really that good. But if you're, you know, on the fence about signing him, and if, you were, if you're a team that's on the fence about signing him and you look at that stat, you look at James Conner's stats in the same offense – you're like, mm, maybe it's not Le'Veon Bell. Maybe it's the offense. Well, I, I think the important thing to look at for Le'Veon Bell is that does this hurt him with other teams? Maybe when other his new teammates look at him and say, hey, are you really committed to this? But, I mean, it didn't take a, an expert to know that the writing was on the wall, that he was not happy with his contract situation in Pittsburgh. And if you pay him, I mean, he's going to be there. I don't. I mean, I don't think this is this was a loyalty problem. Yeah, I just think that he just did not want to be in Pittsburgh if the money wasn't right, and he made that very clear for years. He made that very clear, and so this wasn't surprising. I think it's just dramatic the way it unfolded, but this was this was not surprising. Well, and also, or you look at Le'Veon Bell, and he's going to get picked up by a team, of course, and it. It may not be the best team, but it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a team that needs him. He could go to the Jets. Jets need, you know, a little help. If you, uh, it's going to be a team that probably has a young quarterback that, you know, he's going to be there that he can take a little bit of pressure off of that quarterback. Like the Jets with Sam Darnold. Maybe the Browns with Baker Mayfield. I, they've got a good running back tandem back there right now. I don't know if they would want to, you know, necessarily add him. Uh, the Cardinals may look for him. Who else has got a young quarterback right now? Does Maybe have, the 49ers. Does it have to be a young quarterback? It's more just cap space at this point. Well, cap space and, you know, if you got, if the ideal situation is a back like Le'Veon Bell, you go to a team with a young quarterback that people have to now focus on that running back and not just what the quarterback's trying to do. In more NFL news, tonight the Packers do play the Seahawks, so that's going on. But I want to 
jump to a stat that was shown out uh, a couple hours ago. Only three players have caught a pass while over 40 years old. Jerry Rice has 185. Brett Favre has one. And Tom Brady has joined the club at one. He can do it all. He can do it all except for beating the Titans last week. Yeah. That wasn't good. Uh, Here's another story. Ben Roethlisberger said he texted Le'Veon Bell yesterday before the deadline to ask if he was going to show... And if not, he wished him well in his career. Bell did not text him back. So there's some more Le'Veon stuff for you right there. It's just, it's a hard situation for the Steelers because you, especially just the team really, that this is your brother. You played with him, you fought with him, and he's just, you know, going to go, you know, leave. So it's hard for him. It's hard for all the players, but, again, it's the NFL. It's a business. Le'Veon made a business decision. Pittsburgh Steelers made a business decision not to give him the money he wanted, and they just wanted to franchise him. So everyone is going to need to move on. Le'Veon will be somewhere else next year. Maybe it'll be the Patriots. Fingers crossed. It's not. Because according to Deion Lewis, the Patriots are too cheap, and that's why they got beat. So there you go. And Deion Lewis averaged two yards a carry, and they will be watching the playoffs from their couch this year. I mean, the Titans are five and four. They are, but I will. I am still firmly in my belief that I, I believe I stated a few weeks ago that the two teams there's going to be two teams to come out of the South, and it's going to be the Texans. And uh, your boys, the Colts. Uh, hopefully, the Colts do play the Titans this week at home. Let's go to the NBA. LeBron James passed Wilt Chamberlain for fifth on the all-time scoring list. So, LeBron James is moving into some elite company, along with Kobe, MJ, on that scoring list. And the Lakers got a big win last night when they defeated the Portland Trailblazers 126 to 117. The Lakers have looked like they're coming back into form. The 4-0, I'm not saying that he's the, the, the catalyst to all this, but since they added Tyson Chandler, Lakers are 4-0. Well, and it's like, you know, out of the gate when they struggled, everyone's like, oh, panicking. Oh, no, the, the Lakers, what are they doing? Like, they're, you know, they're, they're bad, they're bad. And you've got to look at it. LeBron's on a new team. He's got a lot of young pieces around him. And the veteran pieces that are, you know, they brought in aren't the best of veteran pieces like Rondo. You look at it was going to take a little bit for the Lakers to get their feet under them with LeBron. And they may be doing it right now. I more thought it would be around Christmas, maybe January, that they would start to get their feet under them. But it could be right now. It looks like, you know, they got a big win last night over the Trailblazers at home. So they're starting to get their feet under them. It was gonna, it was always going to take a little bit for LeBron and the Lakers to get their feet under them. But now they're starting to play a little bit better basketball. They're still going to be, you know, stretches of losses. There's still going to be a lot of down stretches for this team. But... You see they get a slow start. LeBron's got to adjust to playing with everyone, and now they're starting to move forward and start to win games. Jimmy Butler was traded to the Philadelphia 76ers. However, the Orlando Magic spoiled his debut when they beat the Sixers 111-106. I mean, Jimmy Butler didn't play bad. He was 6 for 12 from the field. Didn't hit a three. Had four rebounds, two assists. Ended the game with 14 points, so not a bad debut for Jimmy Butler, but where does Jimmy Butler on the 76ers team put them? Now remember, the 76ers did give up Robert Covington and Dario Sark. So are the Sixers a legitimate contender in the East against the Celtics and the Raptors? They were already legitimate. They were. So let me let me rephrase that question. They were already legitimate. They were. But does this put them in a better position? I don't think it. I think it puts them in a slightly better position. I don't think it wins them the East. 
because I think that the Celtics are just too good. But I think this gives them an edge over teams like the Raptors and the Bucks, and that they can make the finals, the not the NBA finals, the Eastern Conference finals. They can make the conference finals. But I still think I'm still firm of belief that the Celtics are going to win that the East. But it gives them a fighting chance. I think instead of it being you know four or five games, it maybe goes five, six, maybe even seven games in that series. So let's talk about the biggest news coming out of the NBA. Let's talk about KD, Kevin Durant, and Draymond Green. They got into a spat at the end of a game where the Warriors lost, and the result was Draymond Green was suspended the next game, I believe, against the Hawks, without pay. And so there's been some, it looks like, turmoil coming out of Golden State. The underlying kind of story under that is Steph Curry is out for at least five more games. So the Warriors are kind of, kind of aren't having the best of times. And one, uh, according to NBCSports.com, Helen uh, writes that one Warriors player said that with what was said, there's already no way Durant is coming back to Golden State. So it looks like, and look, we knew that the way the contract situation was set up, that it would be hard to keep everybody. Like, Boogie Cousins was obviously wasn't going to stick around for more than one year. He, he was kind of the, you know, I'm going to be there one year and bounce. But it was hard to keep Clay, KD, Steph, Draymond. It was going to be hard to keep all of them. And so it looks like KD could be gone after this year, and especially as there's already some, like, heated conversation going on between the Warriors. So I'm not saying that this is the the end of the Warriors dynasty because even without Kevin Durant, somebody's going to step into those shoes who's not as good as Kevin Durant but can still make this Warriors team really, really scary if they're not scary already. Well, you see... All, all dynasties come to an end, especially in the NBA. Sometimes, you know, football dynasties kind of last a little bit longer because you can have, you know, coaches. In football, it's more of a, you know, the coach is the head man. In the in NBA, it is, you know, more player-driven. Now, Kevin Durant, after, you know, probably out at, out at the end of this year, from what, you know, all the re- people are saying, all the reports, Kevin Durant holds grudges, so he's probably out at the end of the year. This incident didn't help him. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if Draymond was out at the end of the year as well. Via trade or just leaves. Because, or at least whenever his contract is up, he leaves. Because what it looks like right now is, you look at this Warriors team, Kevin Durant is kind of the outsider. They brought him in. They'd already won a championship. They brought him in. And Draymond, right now, if you're Draymond, you're looking at this, and you're like, y'all are picking him over me. I was here first. I'm part of the original cast. You're picking the outsider over me. So that may leave a bad taste in his mouth that the Warriors are picking Draymond, or picking Kevin Durant over him. So he may not like that. Now, the Warriors, if they want to, you know, try to keep Kevin Durant, they could potentially try to move uh, Draymond before the trade deadline. I don't think that's going to happen, but it's a possibility. They may, you know, attempt to ship Draymond out, get some assets back, and hopefully keep Kevin Durant. Because if you ship Draymond out, you've got Boogie Cousins there, and... Cousins can do the exact same thing that Draymond can, possibly a little bit better. So if you want, if you are picking, and I'm not saying the Warriors are picking sides here, but if the Warriors want to keep Kevin Durant, they can move Draymond because as of right now, I don't see a scenario where beyond this year these two coexist on the same team with the Warriors. So... It's gonna. It's 
It's a very, very tough situation. And the Warriors have to decide what to do. I mean, it's a it's a tough it's a tough situation. I, I think one of the bigger things is that you know for the Warriors you don't you're at the top, so everybody's gonna wanna see you fall back down. Yeah. And so I think the biggest thing is what Matt Barnes said. So Matt Barnes was on ninety five point seven the game. And he said that I texted both those guys last night saying that this is what the world wants. The world wants this dysfunction between you guys because when you're at the top, it's lonely up there, and people are always bidding for you, and people always want you to fall. And so it's true that, you know, people want the Warriors to fall because of what they've done to the NBA. And so what what does that mean, you know, going forward for this team? Well, hopefully – no more dysfunction. Hopefully, when Draymond gets back on the court with KD, that they can work together again for the Warriors' sake. But let's and um, one more point that one of the you know key things about this is Draymond was one of the lead guys in the recruitment of Kevin Durant. He was. Which you know this that means the relationship has turned on its head from Draymond being like, "Oh, come on, play with us. You're, you know, you're great. Come play with us. We're all, you know, it's a fun group out here." To Draymond now fighting with Kevin Durant. So that's another, you know, big thing is that Kevin Durant may look at this and he's going to he probably holds grudges and he's like, "You wanted me here and now you're fighting with me." That's just another, you know, Another egg in the basket. Brooks, let's move on to college football. Let's move on to what you're probably waiting for in our game picks. Are you talking to me or are you talking to the audience? No, well, waiting Brooks, for. the audience already knows it's over. Excuse me. So it's now more on to can you make a comeback? Brooks, you currently have a five game deficit to make up. True. I'm sitting at seventy one and thirty nine on the year. You're at sixty six and forty four. Let me go ahead. You went seven and three last week to my nine and one. Let me go ahead and state that I have officially decided as I was walking in this morning, I officially decided to hold my hold the card that we picked twenty games until rivalry week. So I have one last stand. Are you sure? Yes, I'm going to try to hold ground this week, maybe gain a game or or two, and then next week I will make my push. Are you sure? Because Robert Week is... I will say that Robert Week is a lot more... Well, no, I guess that works out in your favor. If it's more unpredictable... I could get some games to go my way. You can get some games to go your way. So, you already decided. Yeah, I decided on walking in this morning. I was thinking about it, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to wait. I'm going to make my final. I'm going to be That's like, it's going to be Brooks's last stand next week. Here's the thing. You don't know what the first 10 games are, and you don't know what those extra 10 games are. You don't know these games going in. No. And, heck, even I just put down these games less than an hour ago. So, here what would have been those extra picks if he were to use the comeback. So these are not the games we're actually picking. No. Okay. These would have been the extra picks. Okay. Ohio State versus Maryland. Okay. Michigan State and Nebraska. My personal favorite, Colgate versus Army. All right. Hey, Colgate's a very good team if you look at the stats. Sure. Wisconsin versus Purdue. Miami, Virginia Tech. Mm, that, that's going to be an interesting game to watch. USC, UCLA. Stanford, Cal. San Diego State, Fresno State. Mm-hmm. Pittsburgh, Wake Forest. That, if Pittsburgh wins this weekend, they win the ACC Coastal. And last but not least, over in SunTrust Park, number seven, Jacksonville State versus number two, Kennesaw State. And a battle of top ten FCS teams. 
So you slipped three FCS teams in there. Look, the extra twelve. If you look at Colgate's numbers, extras. if you look at Colgate's numbers, they're more dominant than Alabama is in the FCS landscape, or in the landscape that whatever division that they're in, they're very dominant. And so to go against Army is a really good game that I, I implore people to watch, if you can. I don't even know if it's on TV. I assume it is. I'm sure it's an it's the one of the one of the academies. I'm sure it's on somewhere. So those would have been the games you would have been able to pick if you used to come back. You did not. That's okay. You're going to hold it for Rob for a week. I don't know what that will entail, but I guess you're going to try to scrape some wins off of this one. It's Brooks' last stand. I'm so let's, let's start with our first game. Northwestern on the road, the Minnesota. The important thing about this is number 22 Northwestern is technically an underdog. Minnesota's favored by one point. But, I mean, that's nothing. Yeah. Because you, typically it's a three-point swing to the home team. I'm so going... Technically, Northwestern's favored by two. They are. I will take Northwestern in this game. The thing about Minnesota is that they know how to score. However, their defense has been lackluster. Granted, the Purdue win did help them in that category. It was a very impressive Purdue win. However, their defense usually lackluster. A Northwestern knows how to score points. A Northwestern has a pretty good defense, being a Big Ten team. So I would take Northwestern on the road in this one. Minnesota, they've got two chances to get bowl eligible this weekend. And if they lose this weekend, it's Wisconsin next weekend. I'm not sure who they have a better chance of beating. I'm going to come out the gate firing here. I'm rowing the boat. I'm going to take Minnesota in the upset this weekend, get bowl eligible, and secure themselves a better record than they had last year under P.J. Flagg, continuing his steady growth. Number 12, Syracuse, visits number three, Notre Dame, in the Bronx in Yankee Stadium in one of the biggest matchups this week. Notre Dame... I will take Notre Dame in this one, being almost a 10-point favorite, or they're more than a 10-point favorite, excuse me. It is 10.5 currently. And Syracuse has a really good offense. It's an offense that averages almost 44 points a game. But Notre Dame has one of the better defenses. Notre Dame can grind out wins, and then most importantly, they're going to have Ian Book back. And I don't care that this game is in New York. It doesn't mean it's a Syracuse home game. Because, you know, New York is a smorgasbord when it comes to college football fans. There's just going to be fans there in general. And there's a lot of um, Notre Dame fans just everywhere. Anywhere you go, you're going to find Notre Dame fans, except for maybe, you know, the remote portions of, like, northwest New Mexico. But everywhere else, you're going to find a lot of Notre Dame fans. Hmm. Okay. Ian Book, I think that's the key factor here is they get Ian Book back. I think that Syracuse is a little bit overrated. They're, you know, they should be like 16, 17 maybe. I don't think they're a 12. I'm taking Notre Dame. Ian Book comes back with a vengeance this week, and they, it's going to be, it'll be 10 points or more. West Virginia goes on the road to Oklahoma State. I'm going to go ahead and just pull the trigger on this one. West Virginia has a good defense, so I'm going to take the Mountaineers on the road over an Oklahoma State team. Looking to be ball eligible, however... It won't be this week, although I do know the line is a lot closer than what people expect. It is West Virginia by four and a half right now. West Virginia, I think besides Oklahoma right now, is the most complete team in the Big 12, and they've shown it several times this year. Oklahoma State, they can, they've shown they can pull upsets, especially when they're at home, but that's usually like night games at home, and it's under you know the big lights. This is a 2.30 kick. In Stillwater, I'm going to take West Virginia in this one. It's going to be close, but Oklahoma State will have to wait until next week to try to get bowl eligible. Boston College goes on the road to Florida State. And the reason why this game is juicy to pick is because it's a ranked Boston College team on the road to a Florida State team that is looking to keep its bowl record streak alive. Florida State has been to, I believe, uh, 38, 39, 40 straight bowl games. 
Going straight next to it because of last year. But 36 in a row. 36 in a row. It's a Florida State team that's trying to keep that alive. The line is only at one and a half, so it's a push pretty much. It's, it's in Florida State's home. And it's a tough one to pick. But if Florida State could not put up a fight against a Notre Dame team that didn't have Ian Book at home, I don't know. I'm going to I'm gonna go on a limb and say this is going to be the end of the streak right here. Boston College will defeat Florida State. And unless they got some smart boys over at Florida State, they're not getting in at 5-7. and seven. Florida State, I have not seen anything this year that could tell me they can beat a ranked team, even though they're at home, even though it is, you know, they're in desperation mode. They're, they have the motivation to keep the bowl streak alive. I think what will, would serve Willie Taggart and this Florida State team the most is that you lose the streak and you – you, you lose the streak, and you have that as motivation going into next year. Like, hey, we this school has won or has gone to 36 bowl games in a row, and you're the class, you're the team that caused that not to be. And they use that as motivation going into next year. I'm going to take Boston College. Cincinnati. This is game day, by the way. Cincinnati, number 24 Cincinnati goes to Orlando to play the undefeated Knights of UCF in a game where a lot of eyes will be on the AAC. A night game on ABC. I'm going to pull the trigger. Cincinnati's defense will be one of the best defenses that UCF will face this year. Cincinnati's offense is really good against defenses that aren't. A UCF defense is bad. This is the the exact moment. It just lines up perfectly well for UCF to run to a team that they're mismatched against. The game still favors UCF, but this is a team that can work well against a lot of their weaknesses. It's on prime time in your stadium. You're finally getting the big light on you, and you lay an egg. I'm going to pick Cincinnati in this game. I picked Temple against UCF when it was kind of a semi-big game, and Temple gave him a run. If Temple can give UCF a run, then this revamped Cincinnati team that lost to Temple can easily give UCF a run. So I'm going to pick the Bearcats. I like I like your way of thinking. I just I they're like UCF has gotten to be where they're like Alabama to me, where you like they're not that good, but you don't like every time you pick against them, they're like yeah no we're not going to lose this game. Like if you if people went into a few weeks ago and they're like oh LSU's got a real shot we're going to pick LSU, Alabama's like no LSU no. We're like last year with the national championship. Oh, Georgia's got the most complete team. Alabama's, you know, they made they stumbled their way into the national championship. Georgia's going to win this. Alabama's like, no. I don't know. We've I, got Tua. No. I picked Alabama both times. I don't know what you're doing. I'm just – UCF, I, I, I want them to lose a game so bad. I, I'm just – I'm tired of UCF. I'm tired of the – Oh, we're the national champions. No, you're not. You didn't win the national championship. I'm tired of UCF just hanging around, but I can't pick against them. I think UCF comes out and shows out in front of the national cra- the national media, the national on the national stage, and makes their push toward a possible playoff spot. They're not going to get in. I, they don't have the strength of schedule, but the thing they is- they want they're going to use this game, they're going to win this game, they're going to use it as ammunition, like, we won on the national stage against a ranked opponent, put us in the playoff. The thing about UCF is that I would have picked them and they would have looked better against Navy last week. It was a 2-7 and seven Navy team. So you know what Navy's going to do offensively. And you still only won 35-24. to 24. It should have been that close if you're a top 15 team against Navy. No, come on. I just, I have a hard time picking against them. 
And I, that, that, I think they're good. Uh, that's fair. But if this if there's a game on their schedule they're going to lose, it's going to be Cincinnati. If I'm wrong this week, I'll, it's going to be the happiest I've ever been wrong. Arizona goes on the road to play Washington State. Washington State eighth in the country, but Arizona trying to look to be bowl eligible. The Pac-12 just loves beating up on itself. So this is one of those games where that could entirely happen because Washington State is due for a big L for some odd reason this season. But uh, I'm going to take the Cougs in this one. It's hard to pick against the Cougars. Arizona trying to get bowl eligible this weekend under their first year under Kevin Sumlin. But Mike Leach and this Washington State team, Gardner Minshew, they're all just – it's something different we've seen from the Pac-12 that it doesn't look like they're going to stumble. Usually, you know, Pac-12 teams, when they're this good and they're in the top ten, they're going to stumble again and fall out and just knock themselves out of the playoff race. I don't see this right now from Washington State. Maybe next week when they play Washington – because that's a rivalry game, and at, that's their last hurdle. I'm taking the Cougars, Washington State, to win this one. Missouri is on the road to Tennessee and a weird one. Missouri's already bowl eligible, and Tennessee is knocking on the door to be bowl eligible. It's a Missouri offense that can score a lot of points, but it's a Tennessee offense that can. However, they then struggle. They score 30 against Auburn, but then 14 against Charlotte. So, what Tennessee team shows up? Well, I'm going to say this. Tennessee won't outscore Missouri because Missouri's offense will eventually break that Tennessee defense because just the way Missouri plays. So, I'll take Missouri on the road on this one. Missouri, five-and-a-half point favorite. Tennessee, you've got Missouri this weekend. you got Vanderbilt next weekend. You need one win. I will say that line did drop one point in the span of an hour. It was six-and-a-half. Tennessee needs one win to get bowl eligible. They've got Missouri this weekend, Vanderbilt next weekend. It's not going to be this weekend. Drew Locke and the Missouri offense are going to be a little too much for this Tennessee defense. I'm taking the Tigers. UAB. The Blazers are going on the road to College Station to play the Texas A&M Aggies. It was probably the most interesting game of the day. UAB coming back from the dead. As a football program, getting to the Conference USA Championship, clinching it last week, they're going on the road to A&M, and it's just an interesting matchup for both teams. You will be trying to get a big win over an SEC school, and then Texas A&M just trying to find their footing again. And as much as I want to pick UAB to win this game, I'm going to sit with Texas A&M. A&M's, first of all, rush defense is scary good. So that, that will make UAB one-dimensional. And I don't believe a one-dimensional UAB offense can match a Texas A&M defense. And I also believe that A&M's kind of dual threat option in Kellen Mond, along with their threats that they have on the offensive side of the ball, will be too much for UAB. They'll spread them out and they'll run all over them. So give me Texas A&M. It would, probably would be a close one, but the final score probably won't be indicative of what the actual game was. Texas A&M, they've, you know, they've been on and they've been off this year. Jimbo Fisher is going to get – I've gotten this team to a bowl game. They're going to start – they're going to keep improving. They've got one of the top recruiting classes in the country coming in. UAB, it's a good story. You know, you're dead. Your football, po- football program doesn't exist. You come back, your first. this is their second year back, correct? Second or third. First year, you get to the Bahamas Bowl. You know, yeah. nice little trip down there. But you do lose. But you still got to a bowl game your first year back. Now you're, you know, 9-1 and one going to the Conference USA Championship game. You're going on the road, a big stage. This is 6 o'clock kick on e- one of the ESPNs, I believe ESPN2. Hey, that's big for UAB. But there's still a Conference USA opponent against an SEC opponent. You've just got to look at, you know, the players. And, yes, UAB, you can make the argument. They're going to have to fight. They're going to come out, and they want to prove something. A&M's going to be a little bit too much. I'm going to take the Aggies in this one. 
Utah's going on the road to Colorado. Utah ranked 19th in the country, I believe. I'm using my imagination correct. Going on the road to a Colorado team that is 5-5. Five and five. And by 5-5, five and five, I mean they started 5-0, and oh, was ranked, and then they lost five straight to the point where they have now told their coach he is not returning at the end of the year. So I'm just going on a limb. Give me Utah already. I don't really need to break down this game other than the fact that Colorado's doing this, Utah's doing this. Colorado needs one win to get bowl eligible. That's not this weekend. Give me Utah. They're going to win this one going out. And to end the show, the last pick, the Iowa State Cyclones are traveling to take on the Texas Longhorns in probably the bigger, one of the bigger matchups of the week, along with Notre Dame, Syracuse, and Cincinnati, UCF. I, I just want to point out, this is a 7 o'clock kick, and it's two ranked teams, and it's on the Longhorn Network. That's what happens when you make your own network. And in a game that's in, so interesting for the Big 12, as much as I want to pick Iowa State, there's two things. A, the nine of names Iowa, and B, it's just setting up for a Texas win, the way everything's kind of going. Texas has struggled the past couple of weeks. Iowa State has been good the past couple of weeks. And usually for the Big 12 and the Pac-12, in games like this, it switches dramatically. Yeah. So I think Texas' defense will kind of rattle Iowa State's true freshman quarterback. And I think Texas has the offense to put up major points on Iowa State to where they can get out to a pretty sizable lead and probably keep it. Although I think it can be close. But I'm going to pick Texas in this game as much as I want to pick Iowa State. If this was at Iowa State, I'd have a harder time picking this game. I just think Texas, they they kind of they started off really well. Everyone said, oh, they're back. And then they kind of stumbled down the stretch a little bit. And we were like, oh, well, they're not actually back, but they're back, kind of back. And they're going to keep being kind of back this weekend. I'm taking the Longhorns over Iowa State. So, Brooks, you said you wanted to scrape your way back into the pick them, but we only picked differently on two games. I'm just setting myself up. You know, I said I'm going to, you know, hold tight and maybe get one or two games this weekend. That's what I'm doing. Well, Brooks, that's going to do for the show this Thursday as we go into next week. Now, remember, next week is Thanksgiving break. So, there is no show for so fact that, well, none of us will be here. Yes. And the station is closed. So, there's no show. A lot of time. However... If you visit us by looking below at the extra the extra underscore point, you can see us when we update our picks and our college football playoff brackets. You can be able to see all of that on the extra point Twitter account. If you want to keep on more episodes of the extra extra point, excuse me, I'm getting Stumble there. Look, I'm already checked out for Thanksgiving break. All right, it's it's already here for me. If you want to keep on more of the extra point, make sure that you look on SoundCloud on iTunes by searching WEGL 91.1 FM. And also, we are on the video format for Eagle Eye TV on Eagle Eye TV Channel 6, EagleEyeAuburn.com, or online on YouTube at Eagle Eye TV. For Brooks Childress, I'm Jared Dill saying so long. And we'll see you guys, hey, in November, December area right there. Don't forget your Thanksgiving pants, folks.